So today we're a small group, so we'll just um, probably skip the participant overview since we already did that. Um, and then James will talk a little bit about health promoting schools and how that ties in with sexual health to a certain extent. Um, and then I'll talk a little bit about sexual health and what is it. Um, we probably have some ideas about what it is, but really um, getting into the definition. And then um, a little bit about the work that we're doing around um, revamping the sex book. And then um, would love to have a little bit of time to, to hear a bit about your experience with the book and some ideas that you might have um, as we go through the process of doing more formal engagement with teachers and administrators and students. So we'll probably, we see uh, who is here with us today. I think we'll probably just skip that part um, since we're such a small group and we, um, we're all here this morning as well. So we'll, we'll just say welcome. <laughs> yeah, welcome. Good idea. <laughs> um, and, and this will be a recap as well. So I um, discussed uh, health promoting schools. So you'll see uh, these slides are identical to what was presented this morning. Uh, but in terms of since we're recording, this is a bit of a legacy. So if people want to view the, this presentation, we'll kind of we'll go through and I'll describe these uh, slides as well. So Health Promoting Schools has been around uh, for a number of years. It's actually based on uh, the Ottawa Charter of Health Promotion uh, back from 1986 with the World Health Organization. Um, and in Nova Scotia, we've been uh, undertaking a health promoting schools model. Um, since about 2006, we've been able to provide funding uh, to schools specifically. Um, because it's been developed over time, health promoting schools actually takes on a number of different names uh, in, the, in the province, depending on what region you're in. Um, so if you are in Western zone, uh, you may know it as healthy school communities. In the Eastern zone, it can be known as Blossom. Um, and in the Central and Northern zones, it's, uh, it's usually referred to as health promoting schools. And the governance of um, health promoting schools is a little different across uh, the province as well. So that makes us unique. Um, so it speaks to the regional development of health promotion schools. Um, and uh, But it may also be confusing. Um, but there is a, a core principle or a number of core principles that have been developed. And that is to change the context within school communities in order to make students default decisions, healthy decisions. So what we're doing is applying health promotion principles to school communities uh, to change environments within schools. So comprehensive school health is an internationally recognized approach to supporting improvements in students' educational outcomes while addressing school health uh, in a planned, integrated, and holistic way. So recognizing that education and health are not distinct entities, but really work together, um, uh, ideally work together to um, create healthy students who are, who are better learners and, and environments that are healthy environments to learn in. So it recognizes that healthy students uh, learn better and achieve more. It understands that schools can directly influence students' health and behaviors. It encourages healthy lifestyle choices and pro promotes students' uh, health and well-being. It incorporates health into all aspects of school and learning. And it links health and education issues and system needs um, uh, the participants to, with the participation and support of families and the community at large. Um, the term comprehensive school health is widely used in Canada. Uh, in other jurisdictions, the approach may be known as health promoting schools. The components may be expressed in different ways. However, the concepts are all the same uh, and supported through the World Health Organization. So the next slide is a little bit busy. Uh, and it comes from a document that Gary Roberts uh, did for the province of Nova Scotia called uh, Faster Alone, Farther Together, uh, Further Together in 2009. Um, and this was these were recommended directions for Nova Scotia's health curriculum. So health promoting schools approach integrates the curriculum, uh, it, a healthy school environment, health services, and parent and community involvement in a coordinated fashion for the benefit of both students and staff. So we know that poor academic performance shares risk factors with health risk behaviors. We discussed that this morning as well. Um, and health promoting schools approach aims to contribute to improved learning. So if we look at it from that broader perspective, uh, in a dynamic and vibrant health promoting school, 
participation, empowerment, equity, and democratic processes are emphasized. Students and staff take active responsibility for their own health um, and that of the school environment. And in so doing, they're practicing citizenship in their school, their community, and contributing uh, directly to the core mission of schools. So pretty lofty goals, um, but we're very fortunate that we have um, health promoting schools initiatives uh, occurring across the provinces. And I've had the opportunity uh, to begin uh, a process in terms of coordinating uh, those teams provincially. So the next slide is just to look at um, what does health promoting schools, how do we fund what we do? So we have three pots of funding that we have available. There's school healthy eating program funding, uh, school food and nutrition policy funding, and health promoting schools funding. So it's a total of $3 million that's used throughout schools in Nova Scotia. And there's a, an equity formula that we follow to distribute those funds. But really, um, the graphic up in the corner uh, gives a description of the four pillars approach to health promoting schools. So there's the development of healthy school policy. There are community partnerships and services. There are teaching and learning op opportunities or curriculum. And then focusing on the physical and social environments. And the four aspects that we undertake, and this was adapted from Western Zone, but this is fairly consistent across the province, are um, in terms of what we've fund our physical activity initiatives, healthy relationship uh, initiatives, healthy practices, and healthy food environments. So a big component of our funding really goes to healthy eating initiatives. So school breakfast programs, for example, um, that's a big component of what we fund. But we also fund initiatives um, around those other three areas um, and really try to focus on well-being uh, for students. And finally, the last complicated slide is really a chance to look at, so this is what we call the health impact pyramid. Uh, so it goes from uh, broad initiatives that engage in so socioeconomic factors, um, and then moving up the pyramid, changing the context to make individual uh, uh, to make, sorry, individuals' default decisions healthy, uh, long-lasting protective interventions, and then clinical interventions, and in, finally, individual and counseling initiatives. So it is a complicated slide, but there are what um, this was adapted from the Western Zone as well. And there are uh, shades with the multi-tiered system of support. So for you as educators um, may recognize uh, the components are similar to the MTSS and the three tiers. Um, so you can think about it in the same way, but there are even, um, we have broader uh, levels below that, um, that what, they, what you work at in the classroom level. And actually that's where health promoted promoting schools tries to fit um, in this uh, health impact pyramid. So looking at those broader based um, impacts that really uh, engage the entire school community and really look at socioeconomic factors and trying to um, coordinate to make um, the healthy decision, the easy decision for youth and for kids. The other um, areas are just there are a number of uh, different partners who are engaged in, in uh, healthy schools work and some of those are, are laid out but they they tend to function at uh, the more narrow points of the um, pyramid so schools plus for example uh, works with uh, 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 clinical uh, staff as well as health promotion staff in engaging programming with with youth and with families. Uh, the adolescent outreach model through mental health is also um, more geared. They do some health promotion work, but they are often more geared at the upper levels of the pyramid. Great, thanks, James. So we'll get into the more specifics about sexual health now, and just basically get into what sexual health is. I think there's a lot of kind of key things that come to mind, both in an educational setting and more broadly. So I just wanted to go through um, what, what is our working definition of sexual health. So I'm going to read this because I think it's important, even though it is um, a pretty long definition. So sexual health is a state of physical, emotional, mental, and social well-being in relation to sexuality. It's not merely the absence of disease, dysfunction, or infirmity. Sexual health requires a positive and respectful, 
respect, respectful approach to sexuality and sexual relationships, as well as the possibility of having pleasurable and safe sexual experiences free of coercion, discrimination, and violence. So this is the definition that's used by the World Health Organization and also in the Canadian Guidelines for Sexual Health Education. So um, more than just Annie Morrison uh, coming up with this definition here. But there's um, a few key parts of it that I wanted to draw your attention to because even um, for people who are immersed in this work, there's um, a lot of values and stigma around sexuality that, that tend to kind of slant how we view sexual health and how we educate about sexual health. So first of all, sexual health is not merely the absence of disease. And that comes back to our broader definitions of health um, that mean that just because you're not sick or in the hospital um, that you're well. So same thing with, with, um, with sexual health is that there's lots of things around um, identity, agency, if you're equipped um, with the right skills and, and communication to engage in, in healthy relationships, those are all things that are not necessarily mean you're sick or unwell, but you might not have the ability to have that um, physical, emotional, mental, and social well-being. Um, the second part I wanted to draw your attention to definition um, is that it requires a positive and respectful approach to sexuality and sexual health includes pleasurable and safe sexual experiences. Um, so these are two things that I think are a challenge for a lot of us um, working in the field is that um, because sexual health has been so stigmatized, um, we tend to focus on STIs and unplanned pregnancies in terms of um, youth sexual education, which are super important um, aspects of uh, of sexual health and, and particularly for youth, it's of, of high interest for, for them. But we also have to remember that the definition, um, that frame of it, even though we're moving away from an abstinence-based approach to um, sexual health education, it still takes a very negative approach. So if we go in um, basically with our um, back raised, worried about all these risks, um, we fail to consider that sexuality is an important part of being human. Um, and that there are positive aspects that can contribute to adult and youth well-being. So um, trying to, to find that balance and remembering that um, there is uh, positive aspects to sexuality is, is an important one to keep in mind. And I wanted to briefly touch on sexual rights. This, um, this slide, again, is pretty detailed. I won't go through it all, but I wanted to have it here um, in case you want to refer back to the slides or the presentation at some point. Um, but we work from a place where a lot of things related to sexual health are entrenched already in recognized national laws and, and human rights documents. Um, so um, working from a place that youth actually have a right to sexual health education because it enables them um, to, to exercise their human rights, so to, to protect their integrity and their um, integrity of person, essentially. Um, means that they are able to seek, receive, and impart information related to sexuality. So being able to give them um, trusted information that they can refer to to make their own decisions is um, an important way that they're able to um, achieve their, their human rights and as well their sexual health. So Jane, do you want to take this one here? I can. I couldn't find my mute button. Um, oh. <laughs> so, <laughs> so just looking at revamping the reference. Um, so the image in front of you is the cover of the sex book, um, probably an image we've all grown to love over the years. So it's been around for quite a while. I, Natalie and I were trying to figure out um, earlier how long it's been around for. So first introduced in 2004 with the these snazzy um, 1990 graphics. Uh, most recent update was in 2016. And there are a number of topics um, that are included, uh, healthy relationships, decision-making, sexual, uh, sexual assault and cons consent issues, uh, sexually transmitted illnesses, STIs, uh, uh, discussions around preventing pregnancy, uh, issues around reproduction, sexual orientation and gender identity. But we also recognize, and sorry, developed by um, Department of Health and Wellness, DECD, and regional health authorities. Um, and it's provided to, to schools uh, in students in grade seven. So it's traditionally been in a paper resource that is handed out to uh, students at some point in their grade seven year uh, that they are able to keep. 
Um, but we recognize that it is in need of a revamp uh, pretty strongly, not both in terms of uh, the updating the content, which the content has been updated regularly, but really kind of a different vision for providing the information as well as different platforms. So we recognize that um, there is still value in a paper copy, um, but kids are learning online and on a lot of different platforms that we need to get better acquainted with and, and better engaged with. So a question for people assembled, I'm curious uh, what your experience has been uh, in terms of the sex book. Uh, have, uh, has, is the, I guess first and foremost, is the resource handed out at your school or in your community on a regular basis? Uh, and what has your experience been with it? And if you haven't had experience, you can share that as well. Hi, James. I, I was going to type, and then I just realized that's silly. It's much easier to just talk. Um, so, Thank James, you. my um, my initial experience with it was as a parent, and that was a number of years ago, for sure. And it came home, and you know, I mean, my kids were, and, and, and then of course we had it at the house. Um, as a professional at work, I'm a librarian, as I was saying earlier, and. I really, I see it sitting on a shelf. That's all in the book room, right? Just uh, collecting dust with many mm. other sort of resource type things. In especially at, um, sort of in this day and age, like the paper copies are not really used. Paper books just don't get in the junior high is where I'm talking. I work yep. in a middle school yep. and paper copies of pretty much almost every resource unless it's a textbook that um, a teacher is referring to, that they put paper copies aren't used very much yeah. anymore in the classes. And it's just, it's kind of out of the norm for students quite often yeah. um, to, be, to refer to paper resources. I feel, I want to put Annie on the spot for a second, but like you had a, Annie um, uh, was a student in Nova Scotia uh, and you did receive the sex book and it was a piece that, um, was useful for you, like you held on to that, right? If I remember correctly. Yeah, and I'm trying to think if there must have been a precursor to it because I would have been prior to 2004. But, um, but yeah, I do remember the value of because I don't think I would have, for example, gone to the library and asked for it for, right. or something like that. But because I got my own copy, I could kind of take it home and then like look at it in in private. You know, like I had questions and I could look look through it or something like that. So I do remember the value of just being, of having something that I would be able to look at without, then because it was like universally provided, there was no impetus on me to have to seek that information out otherwise. Um, I mean, the difference for me is that, like you said, there was no, like, uh, you know, there was, I guess there was internet, but really it was pretty limited when I was that age. And I certainly didn't have a phone. So I, I wasn't able to in any way, like seek information in a private setting without it being in a paper form. Um, but I do, I still, I still think at least, you know, I think there's something to that having your own copy um, and being able to easily access it. There's something about that, that, that does reach, reach kids. Yeah. Um, but Thank you for yeah, that. but yeah. And um, Abigail uh, had just mentioned as well, so uh, had also had experience as a parent. Um, I, I don't think my kids read it. I kept it for a while mm. and just threw it out not too long ago. So I think that yeah. that's a fairly common uh, yeah. experience as well. That's good insight, yeah. Yeah. So I think we so, can talk about why it needs a revamp, Annie. Yeah, so... Um... Well, the James has already a little bit referred to this. I mean, it, it is over 15 years old now. So that in itself um, creates some uh, drive to want to update the book. So 
Um, and even with the most recent update in 2016, we've kind of changed the content and made sure um, to a certain extent that the information continues to be factual. But in terms of the topics and how it's framed, it hasn't changed a whole lot. Um, so since, I mean, just to give you a taste of some of the content, um, thinking back to 2004, um, our laws have changed a lot since then. So, you know, uh, same-sex marriage was um, legalized in Nova Scotia in 2004 and in Canada in 2005. Um, and then more recently, like we had some um, homophobic content that was removed from the Criminal Code of Canada back in 2016. So um, even the most recent update of, of the sex book doesn't reflect that change. Um, the Im Intimate Images and Cyber Protection Act in Nova Scotia was brought into force in 2017. So um, there's just content like that that just isn't accurate right now. So we need to make sure that um, that, that information is updated. But especially around, um, we've also seen a lot of cultural changes and social movements that have driven and pushed these conversations a little bit more um, that need to be reflected. And, and I think happily do reflect um, a more realistic view of what's going on in, in youth's lives. So we've seen movements in recent years like Me Too um, that talked a lot about sexual assault and sexual harassment in institutions. Um, and then Retea Parsons' death in Nova Scotia um, really change the conversation around consent and communication um, in terms of um, sexual assault. Uh, we've had the Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the inquiry into missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls in Canada. So we've seen um, more publicly, at least, um, a growing understanding around how racism and sexism and how uh, governments have enforced those um, and how they've created really unfair conditions against um, especially racial, racialized and indigenous women and girls in Canada um, and state inflicted sexual violence against um, youth in Canada as well. Um, and then most recently, a social movement like Black Lives Matter, so which is focused predominantly on police brutality, um, but we're also seeing, you know, we, we know from research that um, racialized girls in particular are um, hypersexualized more often than, um, than white girls. Um, so we know that these effects and conversations about race um, have implications for sexual health. And I just want to say that, I mean, these things aren't new. <laughs> these things haven't changed since 2004. Um, the, these systems of oppression and um, systemic racism and sexism have existed in our culture long before then. Um, but now there, there seems to be a lot more awareness, courage, and will to actually act on them. So that's that's a positive but there's and engagement i think there's also engagement. like yeah. commute like interest in interest from people in moving forward to actively mm -hmm. engage in these issues yeah yeah i think that's been a shift since 2004 definitely yeah absolutely even since you know 2019 so um i can't and, believe it. i'm gonna inter interrupt for a second annie i can't believe it annie and james and Steve, that this is the first time it occurred to me that in a revamp of the sex book, we can put in at grade seven, the signs and key messages around human trafficking. I, mm. I, like I've been so much on this file, I can't believe that I didn't realize that this was an opportunity to put in some things. Yeah, yeah, oh, so that's, that's, a cool. that's a good point. Like the, um, the kids in the know curriculum and um, you know, we have an opportunity here to also make sure that this resource is complementing other resources and classroom education. Um, of course, you know, Natalie knows tons about this and you, you folks on the, on the, in the meeting probably do as well about the healthy living curriculum updates for grade sevens and eights. Um, so we wanna make sure that the resource is, is up to date and reflective of those curriculum updates. Um, the Canadian guidelines for sexual health education have also been updated um, in 2019. So that's a nice, a nice place to model off of. And um, and I mean, we can't talk about this without talking about internet use and smartphones and social media. So um, in 2004, I don't really think, I mean, we had internet, I guess phones were maybe on the scene, but not smartphones at the time. And, um, and even, and social media was just in its infancy at that stage. So with that internet use, we've seen internet as a source of information, whether that's good or bad. Um, access to sexualized content um, and pornography has really changed for youth. Um, we've also seen like different ways that youth are being influenced by sec cultural 
um, messages on sexuality. So in terms of advertising, even just content, influencers, all of that stuff um, is kind of evolving in its own way. And of course, the ability with more youth with, with cell phones and social media accounts, we have the opportunity for youth to be um, engaging in sexual relationships, but also um, you know, sharing sexual content among each other now. So that's another um, challenge that's come with, with uh, internet use and, and smartphones. So um, the other thing we regard as an opportunity that goes along with these cultural changes is that we do, we seem to have a broader um, awareness as a society and certainly as institutions on um, this understanding of sexuality and sexual health, that it is more than just STIs and pregnancy and, and certainly more of a focus on he health equity. So we see that within our schools about um, schools and certainly in public health as well about how um, racism, sense of belonging, poverty, housing, um, how all of these are creating ways that are influencing kids long before they arrive in your classrooms or, or in hospitals, um, it's influencing their health. So we have an opportunity and I think along with that an obligation to start to um, address some of those um, inequities that exist for youth. So the project itself, um, we are currently working on this, this revamp and want to make sure that um, we are able to get feedback um, from Nova Scotians, or well, from youth in particular, teachers and schools in, in Nova Scotia, um, as well as stakeholders who are involved with, with sexual health. Um, but we're also doing some review of evidence, so I'll talk about that in a second. But Really what we're looking for is, is insights on the purpose and the role of this resource for youth. Um, how does it complement other work and resources like um, Natalie referred to earlier? And what are some current and emerging issues for youth sexual health in Nova Scotia and sexual health inequities being experienced by youth in Nova Scotia? So a lot of the research that, that um, we look at, that I've looked at is US based or other parts of Canada and sometimes international. So, while that can give us some hints of, of what's going on in Nova Scotia and how youth might be experiencing sexual health, um, we really need to have a better ear to the ground. So that's part of the, the engagement process. And then as James referred to, the, medi the medium and design of delivery. So um, while there, there is probably still value to a, a physical book, we're kind of interested in seeing how can we make that a more um, meet, meet youth's needs better. Um, two things we I did want to say is that we know um, this is a book or it's a, a resource information, so it's not going to change behavior or sexual health outcomes on its own. Um, we know there are so many factors that um, influence youth sexual health, um, break down from the bottom of the period, pyramid to the top, and how their environment more broadly in their schools, in their homes, in their community, in our culture is shaping their health outcomes. Um, and then, of course, classrooms and teachers have an important role to play there too. But um, we think there's a little piece of the puzzle that comes into play with this resource. And then the other thing I just want to be clear on is we're, we're not consulting on the curriculum. That is, is certainly not our area of expertise. Um, so that's a completely separate uh, project happening. So to date, we've done some evidence reviews and starting to plan this engagement. Of course, COVID threw off our, our engagement timeline and engagement strategies. So we're, we're kind of revamping that as well. And we're doing some um, figuring out what data do we have on youth sexual health in Nova Scotia. Um, there's not a whole lot out there, but we're trying to see if what we can find. And so we would like to be engaging with youth, teachers, administrators, and community organizations. I mean, light consultations and conversations happening um, this year, and then maybe in a more detailed one next year, but subject to um, COVID changes. And then with a goal of having um, you still have access to a resource in 2020, 2021 that's updated, but then have um, a more renewed resource for 2021, 2022. I'll send it back to you, James. Yeah, so I will say that um, I was quite excited to uh, um, get this project. So uh, Steve and my uh, manager, Carrie, had been having discussions um, about uh, revamping the sex book for a while and uh, brought myself in and brought Annie in and Natalie in. We had these really great discussions in January and February and we were almost ready to go and then COVID hit. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> so we pulled back a bit, but I think, um, and I think what's exciting, what we were, our original hope I think was to actually do uh, a strong community engagement process 
over the spring and the summer, um, develop a new resource and get that out um, with in this coming school year. Um, obviously, things have been pushed back a bit, although there's still interest in having a resource um, this year in some way. And uh, we were talking about it briefly before we began the presentation. And we might actually have an opportunity to start to build more of an online platform or presence with the existing uh, resource. So there's that opportunity. But we wanted to ask um, you today, how can we best engage with teachers and the students and the school community uh, to get their feedback? So we recognize that uh, COVID has uh, uh, thrown a wrench into everything. Uh, so our ability to, to do traditional focus groups, for example, is probably going to be pretty limited. Um, but I'm curious if we have a few minutes today to talk, just how would you, um, what do you think may work in terms of getting feedback to revamp this resource? So I'll throw it open to the group. Um, hi, James. I feel like uh, our health teachers would be interested in doing um, if you, if you, in delivering maybe a forms questionnaire, something along those yeah. lines, that mm -hmm. um, just in, in terms of sort of where do students find their information now, what would they find helpful, you know, in terms of accessing reliable information and, mm -hmm. and the, the kind of information that they're looking for. I really think the health teachers would be your best um, point of entry just given how burdened everyone feels right now with yeah. the changes and outcomes and, and everything else, whereas health, this would directly relate to those teachers are often looking for things like this that they can do that they could learn from as well. Yeah. Thank you, um, Michelle. How would you feel? How do you feel in terms of library services? Um, do you think that there would be an interest or an uptake in our kind of um, uh, making me ask of that of that group since you're kind of tightly tied in with that. Um, for sure, I know they would be very receptive, and I have to say, it not like as far as speaking representing staff, I think we would be a great um, resource. But as far as accessing students, I don't think we'd be great just because it is a topic that the students have to be comfortable talking about, right? And right. so I think that they're far more comfortable, in fact, with their classroom teachers than even their health teacher. But as far as delivering just a, a survey, like I think that would be a nice um, start. As far as talking to us as a group and just um, getting some feedback that you might be looking for, we, we do have sort of a unique feel from Absolutely. for the school right yep. so mm -hmm. and um i know often not as many see, are are um, as comfortable kind of reaching out and just joining into things like this but um i know that a number feel like they would like to be asked and approached and so yeah i think that you might find that um you would get good reception there i know as far as accessibility i think that um whatever you come up with having it as a open accessible resource on something like overdrive or like an e e um e document yeah. and an audio as well i think would be invaluable mm -hmm. because it, if it was an open borrow that we had sort of unlimited access any student could borrow it anonymously it i think that it would be easily accessible then and would get a lot more use on their phones and, and you know, like discreetly yeah. as opposed to, um, yeah, any other. I know even our students that are learning sort of second languages, I'll often recommend to teachers I formats and or e formats and audio formats because then 
no one else can see what you're reading. It doesn't, right. it, it doesn't carry that stigma, right? Yeah, whatever right. level you're reading or whatever language, whatever it is that you're learning from, no one else has to, um, it, you don't feel that stigma. Yeah. And I, you know what, I appreciate your comments, Michelle. Um, and it's interesting. I agree with you. I think that health teachers are, are first and foremost in terms of who we want to interact with. But I also think there are lots of resource personnel in schools um, who, you know, it, it's really based on the relationship that a student may have. So I suspect that there are a number of students who are comfortable um, talking to somebody at the library more so than talking to, you know, their health teacher. Um, so, and, and I say this because my mom was a librarian. So <laughs> I think that there are a lot of um, kids in school and, and kids who are in, in a lot of ways in riskier environments, um, we need to figure out who they are comfortable talking with and how to best approach um, those adults, right? So I think that, that there's some really valuable stuff in there. I appreciate I that. I spot on agree with you, um, James, and especially those students that are sort of, um, you know, like at a bit of a high risk, the library, yeah. we offer a lot of programming to those kind of groups and students. And often those students, they, they are given permission to... Um, take breaks, walk about breaks yep. um, as they need them. And the library is often a spot that they stop in to put in a few yep. puzzle pieces or to say hi. And so, yep. yeah, we do develop a, quite a rapport with them for sure. And as they do with other specialists, you're right. And, and so, yeah, no, I agree. Excellent. Any other comments? I never know how long to wait when I ask the questions like that online. Um, but <laughs> so if not, uh, just in the interest of time, I know we're starting to run a bit short. Um, we had another uh, discussion question. Annie, did you want to pose that? Yeah, sure. So um, so what do you see as key or emerging issues for youth sexual health in Nova Scotia? So like I said before, we, I mean, just living in Nova Scotia and hearing the news, we certainly have some ideas of, of some emerging issues, but um, we, we don't have our ear to the ground as well as um, a lot of people working in schools do. So we would love to hear any, any feedback that you have on um, big issues for youth sexual health right now or in the, in the coming years. Yeah, and it may confirm some things we already know, but it would mm -hmm. help us to kind of understand what we need to prioritize. Because I think from our public health lens or our own kind of personal background, what, you know, I have a sense about what I'd like to um, uh, push forward, but what, how do we best approach students and get a sense, like, what are the issues that they're seeing? I feel bad not contributing to the uh, conversation, but I just, I'm fairly new back as an, a teacher, so I don't have much experience myself to to help and add. I'm just trying to hear to try to learn. Um, I'm going into junior high teaching healthy living grade nine, uh, and it'll be my first time teaching it. So I wish I could help you, but I, I don't have enough experience to draw from. <laughs> well, can I ask you like on a personal level, Abigail, because I know you have um, you have a couple of uh, teenage children, right? Teenage boys, yeah. I believe. Yeah. Um, would you have a sense in terms of what they or their friends are kind of chatting about? I'm, I, I'm sure that they're not, they're, they're not <laughs> in depth conversations, but um, is there anything that kind of stands out to you from from that perspective? While we're here, <laughs> um, they don't say too much. You know. <laughs> <laughs> they really don't. Um, yeah, no, they don't. I All mean, right. I talk to them privately, but not as they're 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 boys who don't talk a lot, right? And that's right. Um, yeah, that that's a tough one. I can't really really add to that. But I went before the last question when you talked about. I agree. I think a healthy living teacher would be a, a person to look to, and just some kind of even informal Google form um, yeah. to, mm -hmm. to get the students' engagements because that's really what where the feedback you need is how are they going to learn um, mm -hmm. 
what is the best platform to engage them? You know, and and the the book that you say that's why you need to be outdated that that did not engage my kids. I know that. Mm -hmm. uh, I left it. I think on the bedside table for a year. So, you know. <laughs> You cool. did your best. <laughs> exactly. but I think I think going to the students with a uh, with an informal Google form and and seeing I don't know the logistics of this, but if the schools agree to have the healthy living teacher have a discussion um, of, about that for one of the classes, just asking the kids' opinions, what would be the best way to to right. engage you guys? Uh, mm -hmm. and even a, a student-led kind of brainstorming session could be yeah. really fun for teachers as well as really it will give us a lot of information um, if you know to get kids to speak broadly and and put it all out there uh, could be really helpful for us I, I, I think that. a student brainstorming would be the best way and you can, have, you can gather all that information that comes out of that and it could be at the end of the brainstorming here fill out this google form that and put together yeah 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 i wonder if it could be like a conduit sometimes because even even for teachers i i know it's sometimes challenging to start to talk about these topics with students because they are they are really sensitive um i mean the topics are sensitive um so yeah so even having that be integrated somehow within starting to raise those issues is sometimes a helpful prompt we actually have heard that youth actually want to talk about those things in class and so they want yeah. it more out in the open as opposed to um, anonymous and so you know building on Abigail's um, great insights and observations um, uh, you know and kind of and, and assumptions I think we probably could look for healthy living classes um, and teachers um, healthy living teachers and even something like this where you actually gave a presentation and welcomed kid you even came in like we're doing now through a google meet and engaged a classroom in that way and that's like, like kind of like what we're calling i think the flipped classroom where mm. there's a bit of uh blended online learning in person and and some kind of more in-person things so i think um yeah abigail made me think that we could probably do it in that way and that way kids don't have to go back and fill out a form um sometimes they tire of those kinds of things but um they could just sort of say what what they've noticed and what's missing and and of course we we've, we've been criticized at times for um not hearing youth particularly to michelle's comments in the, yeah. in the chat box um around being inclusive around different um gender identity and sexual orientations um and and i think broadly speaking across the curriculum we are uh, we have made really great progress in being more inclusive i think sometimes that's harder on the ground um, but what I would say, Abigail, is that we do have a resource. I was looking for it on the Book Bureau and Michelle, uh, but I don't see it there, so I'll have to check out and see where it's gone. But we listed a new resource called Beyond the Basics from Action Canada for Sexual Health and Rights. It's um, a kind of a, a total, actually, revision, revamp of a Beyond the Basics resource that the Canadian Federation for Sexual Health uh, developed, oh, you know, way back in around 2000, the mid 2000s that we provided to schools. But it's really excellent and it gives a lot of um, lessons, first of all, which is great, which we'd like as teachers, but um, also um, a lot of kind of introductions and backgrounds about how we make our teaching less, um, you know, heteronormative. So that when we speak about all of these um, components of sexual health education, um, from relationships to families, to sexual violence, to reproductive safety, all of those things, that we come at it through uh, a more inclusive lens. And it, it really it really models what language that we use. Um, and so I think that's, um, that's a re uh, an excellent resource. And I'll put a link to it in the chat box, or maybe James can put a link to it, um, you know, um, on the um, information page in the Google Docs um, following this presentation. So that you'll be able to access it. It's a good one. Great. And I think I think to Michelle's point again, you know, something that we know is that um, uh, is that our African Nova Scotia youth, you know, have a have a have a different um, and Indigenous youth have you know un unfortunately have a different um, health trajectory at times and have vulnerabilities and um, and systemic racism that um, you know that denies them the same kind of um, sexual health. 
um, that non-Indigenous and non-African Nova Scotia people have. And uh, the same goes for, to Michelle's comment, around uh, disabilities. And so I think that is something that a new uh, sex book um, can, can acknowledge and, um, and have additions in regards to that, while at the same time being inclusive. Yeah, I think I, I would echo those points, Natalie, is that even while we're, for a while, equity work was, when it was getting more normalized, it, like resources are still written for the most privileged audiences with everyone else in brackets. Um, we don't really want to do that anymore, like it's just not reflective of our society anymore, um, or never was. And, um, and to your point, yeah, I think uh, making sure that our resources are reflective of the needs and circumstances for, for youth facing multiple barriers, um, including racism, um, is, is important. But And then also, it goes back to the broader work about, like, we know a resource in itself isn't going to change outcomes on their own. So that's why um, the work that, you know, health promoting schools and the work that um, folks are doing in their classrooms and in their libraries and their schools to make them more welcoming and understanding that you don't arrive in their seats at school from the same um, ability to learn and the same home situation. So how can we more broadly do work in public health and, um, and I guess with, with education and early childhood development and um, in schools to, to change those environments so that youth come um, and have a more fair chance of achieving those, those, that sexual health, I guess. If I could say to um, Annie, although the, it is just a book and it obviously can't change everything, I, I believe there's a lot of value in this as a resource mm -hmm. for even just normalizing topics. So yeah. if, if these topics, although they aren't maybe covered in depth, if they're acknowledged and there's a bit of information there, maybe even some links for someone that's interested in more information... Yeah. Um, or, to, or to people that would be gladly happy answer happily answer questions, and then yeah. it was an accessible resource that um, students could discreetly access and use. Yeah. Then you know that's that's the starting point, right? That's where staff have to be okay. I I guess I have to develop a comfort with these topics mm -hmm. and this language, and that's where students can acknowledge oh okay well if the school board and, and if this is our main resource that they're saying go ahead then um i guess it's okay for me to ask about this or it's okay for me to use this language at school that's so i i, I believe it's very valuable for sure yeah yeah I and i don't want to run i know we're running short of time and i i Speaking of resources, Annie um, developed a great uh, resource list of organizations uh, and supports that help around sexual health services. You may want to speak to that, Annie. And I've also posted it on the Google Drive as well. Yeah, so this, this slide has select um, versions, but I did make a, a, a little bit of a larger list. And it's by no means comprehensive, but um, while we're working on um, a, a lot of these more upstream things and trying to make sure youth are equipped for what's to come, we know there are also um, needs and issues facing youth like right now, today, um, as they will arrive in school in September. So we wanted to make sure that um, folks working with youth had um, resources at hand where they could be directing people or, or even themselves if they wanted to learn more about some of these topics. So, um, so that's here on this slide and then also in yeah, like I said, there's a resource sheet attached to the, the documents with this presentation. And um, a good place to start always is either a youth health center or schools class if you have those in your school. Um, they probably have a, a lot better knowledge than I do about um, local resources available for youth as well. And um, a, a source of information that I think is really great and Canadian is um, sexandyou.ca. And um, as Natalie mentioned, there's Action Canada for Sexual Health sexual and reproductive rights, I think they're called now, um, formerly the Canadian Federation for Sexual Health. So they also have a lot of great information. And their link is in the chat box. Oh, thanks, James. You're and welcome. It's, on the, it's on the broader resource <laughs> sheet. Great minds. Um, and 
So that's great. So our last slide is just some of the resources specific for health promoting schools in the province. So we have a few different websites. Uh, I won't list them in detail, but you're more than welcome to take a look at some of the great work that's happening across the province. Um, and I'm wondering any final thoughts. I, thank you so much for your time and on a humid July day to, to be able to uh, help support our work uh, is a, a great testament to the work that you and the passion that you guys uh, bring to your work. So we appreciate that.